The world is standing at a crossroads. Climate change and human industry are destroying the planet's surface. And due to our ravenous need to clear land and use wood, only one-fifth of the Earth's original forests remain in an undisturbed state. Rich, complex ecosystems that house a myriad of species. Global logging continues unabated. And as we reach the final last stands of trees, people are protesting. Amazonian natives for their homelands and concerned Canadians fearing the complete destruction of these ancient groves. Lately, British Columbia has become a flashpoint for old growth protection. Both scientists and forest defenders are stepping up to help. And we need these forests to address climate change, to make sure we have clean water. Like, so for so many reasons beyond just the fact that they're like natural cathedrals and they deserve to be here. Like we don't, we're, we're just one species of billions, right? And the, the idea of simply turning them into cellulose and board feed um, it has to be a, a kind of act of public policy that our descendants will see as having been a sheer act of folly. So we're in an extinction crisis. We're in a climate crisis. We're in many crises. <laughs> we're facing many crises. The Amazon rainforest is one of the places on Earth that we need to protect to ensure biological and climate stability. We know that this is, this is not some disparate, disconnected situation. From Fairy Creek to Sarayaku, temperate forests to Amazon forest, we see the same patterns, desperate patterns by the industries and companies and financial backers who are set on an economic model that causes destruction. Today on Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada, a battle is being waged to protect the last precious old growth forests in Ferry Creek watershed, and it's coming to a head. To those here, this is the last stand for the last ancient trees on the planet. In contrast to the government's estimate of 23% of old growth left, scientific studies show that less than 3% of harvestable ancient forests remain. A logging company, Teal Jones, has been granted cut permits to rare old growth cedars and Douglas firs in Ferry Creek, also, traditional territory of Pachidot First Nation, whose people are divided on logging the area. Like nearby tribe, the Huwait, leadership here is interested in harvesting their forests to create jobs, while some traditional tribal elders, like Bill Jones, wants to preserve them. Since August 2020, Activist blockades have been set up along logging roads to stop access to those sites. Then a provincial court injunction charging the protesters with trespassing on an approved logging site allowed police to legally remove them. The consequences of that enforcement have proved devastating. From the beginning, blockade organizers, the Rainforest Flying Squad, have done all they could to minimize the effectiveness of this police action. Steve Andrews, an environmental photographer, has been on the front lines. There's been daily resistance um, from people um, of all walks of life, um, from all backgrounds, both indigenous and non-indigenous, people who want to make a stand against this government that said that they would protect the old growth and have failed at that, that job. Based on their study showing the imminent demise of BC old growth, three scientists took their case to the government. Since September, when we received the old growth report by uh, Foresters Gourlay and Merkel, we will implement all of the recommendations contained therein. And not only failed at it, but have actively deceived the public 
in telling the people that they would protect the old growth. The province put aside deferred 200,000 hectares of old growth right across the province. That hasn't happened and, and the logging continues daily. I can feel it in my soul. Government has the ability to change the policy in a heartbeat. They could sign the documents right now to ensure that the old growth forest is saved and protected as they promised that they would do. A core member of the Rainforest Flying Squad, Kathy Code, draws on a lifetime of knowledge in government communications and forest protection. They have dragged their heels on this. People are really not willing to accept this anymore. There was an injunction granted by the BC Supreme Court um, basically in favor of Teal Jones, the logging company, saying that these uh, protesters need to leave and they will do what it takes to clear and they need to, to stop blocking access to the road. After months of opposition to logging in the area, in the summer of 2021, forest defenders were swiftly attacked by police forces to remove them from the road. Police methods used throughout the year were criticized by the world's press and provincial judges. Finding ways of protecting the world's last ancient forests are crucial to both human and old growth survival. Since 1900, one third of the world's old growth forests have disappeared. Trees act as biological pumps, pulling water from the soil, then moving it into the atmosphere. Trees have a cooling effect which controls temperatures, allowing animals to survive and thrive, sheltering an abundance of life, from fungi to millions of insects, to small and large mammals. Trees provide the leaves, berries, and fruit which nurture and sustain these animals. Forests retain carbon, which makes them crucial in combating climate change. The Amazon rainforest is on fire. Leila Salazar Lopez heads up Amazon Watch which helps Amazonian indigenous people prevent industry and agribusinesses from destroying their homelands. Amazon Watch has brought to the jungle such celebrities as director James Cameron, Sigourney Weaver, and Arnold Schwarzenegger, all here to help stop rainforest destruction. And so those of us who defend Mother Earth and protect our water and protect our forests we are standing up for life, but we don't have a lot of time. We don't have a lot of time to be going to another 25 years of climate talks. We don't have, we don't have time for that. So that's why the young people, you know, they don't say let's, let's, let's stand up for climate action. They say let's stand up for climate justice. We will not exist as a species if we do not have forest ecosystems. And this is not on my shoulders, this is on my grandchildren's and even my children's shoulders. I'm here with my fellow land guardians defending the trees, here because we heard the call that came from our hearts, which came from the forest. I'm to the point I can't trust industry, I can't trust government, therefore I need to take a stand with the citizens and uh, we will stand here as long as needed to protect these stands. Rainforest, mist and mystery. Grandmother and grandfather trees, uh, the elder trees are like what nurtures the, the surrounding trees and uh, forest. And uh, it's really important for that uh, relationship to exist. You know, and when you take those things out, you know, other things, the, the younger trees kind of suffer, so. It's kind of like a family relationship, you know, and when those old, old elders are, are gone, you know, our, uh, our generation seems to be more lost. Climate Control Center for the World. From Sarawak to Amazonas. 
Costa Rica to mangy BC hills, cortege rhythm of falling timber. What kind of currency grows in these new deserts, these brand new floodplains? If a tree falls in the forest, does anybody hear? Our cathedral is up here, and we have to save our old growth remnant, which was in fact our cathedral. Yet despite the hopes of traditional elders like Bill, whose tribe owns this land, any discussion of raw resource extraction remains complex. People still need wood and the jobs it provides. Industry experts are the first to voice their opinion. I guess when you see one of those big ancient giants cut down, it's, it's sad. I mean, uh, probably the guy that cut it down feels a twinge of regret. But the other thing that's sad, and, but you don't hear much about, is when a guy comes home from work and has to tell his wife and kids, well, I'm being laid off because the sawmill is shutting down or the pulp mill is shutting down. And we've had dozens of sawmills shut down from a uh, public relations point of view, the environmentalists certainly have an edge because all you have to do is show one photo of a big tree cut down and that, you know, uh, that's an emotional thing. People don't like to see it. Where I come from and in most nations, the way that we look at trees are our ancestors. You know, they're our grandmother, our grandfather, they're your relatives. And that really pissed me off that people we're trying to take these beautiful old growth down. This is the last 2.7% that we have left. It's not just gonna affect here, the west coast on Vancouver Island. It's gonna make its way all the way down to the east coast. This affects the entire ecosystem. What makes these forests so unique is that these are literally a window onto the ancient past. You know, when the flowering plants were uh, born, if you will, they had a mechanism of pollination that gave them a huge advantage. And in short order, the conifers, which once covered the planet, were pushed to the extremities of the world. And in the hotbed of evolution, the tropics, you do not find conifers. There's only one place where they retain their former glory, and that's here on the coast of North America. And the reason for that is very, is very simple. We have hot, dry summers and cold, wet winters. For four decades, Harvard ethnobotanist Dr. Wade Davis has traveled the world and written best-selling books, many about the plants and medicines of indigenous peoples. As a student in the 1970s, Wade studied forestry and worked in British Columbia logging camps, which gives him a special insight. Now, in terms of biomass, they have four times the biomass of any equivalent acreage in the tropics. A single western hemlock has 70 million needles capturing the light of the sun. Those needles, if laid out on the ground, would create a photosynthetic surface 10 times the size of a football field. So both in terms of biodiversity, biomass, sh the sheer wonder of their very existence, these forests are extraordinarily rare. I have been involved in protecting old growth in BC for 29 years now. Hue uh, Ban is from an indigenous Vietnamese tribe, where the ongoing destruction of her family's forests and its medicinal plants has given her a reason to help where she can. I have visited my homelands, my matriarch village, which is in South Vietnam. They have had their jungle ecosystems first destroyed by bombs and, and such during the war years, and they only had about three quarters of it left. When I had arrived, it had been logged so heavily and mined so heavily um, that I could see through the jungle. So when I came back, when I saw the news, I saw that similar things were happening right here in Canada. These old growth forests are worth more than what 
we're currently putting them up for. They're looking at them as timber dollars. Logging forestry, uh, which would include lumber, logs, uh, pulp and paper, uh, accounts for about 27% of the value of BC's exports. So uh, out of $39 billion worth of exports in 2020, uh, forestry would account for about $11 billion. I think it's about 50% of what is logged is left on the ground. Uh, they just, it's called high grading. They just take the very best logs and leave everything else. So they completely destroy the ecosystem. And recent study suggested that about 100,000 jobs are dependent on forestry. 50,000 of those would be direct jobs. Among the beneficiaries of those jobs are First Nations, including those near Ferry Creek, who are now just emerging from years of social injustice, poverty, and abuse. Adding complexity to the logging issue are the inherent rights of Native communities to benefit from resources in their territories. With years of experience heading initiatives to protect forests and rivers, Chief Robert Dennis speaks for the adjacent Huayat tribe. Forestry is definitely going to enable a huge change in our community. Because number one, it has provided more financial benefits to the nation. Number two, we have been able to do more for ourselves. Every cubic meter of wood logged off treaty lands, we take $5 per cubic meter and put it into watershed renewal so we can build the salmon stocks and the salmon streams in Hoya Territory. And, and for the first time last fall, I seen a lot of fish in this Rita River again. That was beautiful to see. It's enabling us to provide employment opportunities for our people, sustainable, well-paying jobs. Uh, and it's enabling us to, to enhance our programs and services that the Huayat First Nation has. And uh, I, I'm proud of what Huayat does. A longtime resident, Shauna Knight, is a key Ferry Creek organizer and spokesperson, Ultimately, addressing the world's press. Well, we're not anti-logging at all. This movement fully recognizes and understands that logging is a, a very important part of BC's economy and, you know, culture, really. But we're against old-growth logging because there are so few of those big, big trees left. And, for instance, Ferry Creek here, it's a one-of-a-kind ecosystem in the whole world. And the latest studies by BC scientist Suzanne Simard show the complexity of Pacific Northwest forests by revealing that trees are connected below ground via a vast fungal network. Trees use this mycorrhizal network to send and receive chemical messages. As forests become stressed, seedlings are more dependent on these networks for survival, and most surprisingly, Studies reveal that ancient, so-called mother trees seem to nurture their offspring seedlings on the forest floor. Every time you step on the soil of a forest in British Columbia, you are stepping on hundreds of miles of mycelial filaments that are the actual matrix of nature in our lives. And suddenly we find Suzanne showing that trees communicate with each other only in place of words through chemicals. Now, if I had said that to my foreman or my boss in that logging camp on Haida Gwaii, I probably would have been put into a straitjacket and carried right off the island. In another effort to convince government to stop logging in Ferry Creek, a group of scientists meet at base camp to reveal newly discovered rare animal and plant life. Yeah, so there, there are the species at risk, which we found so far. And the other one of interest is this character down here, the little brown bat. Could the presence of this bat stop the logging in Ferry Creek? And these discoveries aren't limited to unique animal and bird species, but also include unusual lichen. We've sort of estimated that this is probably the biggest population of this species of lichen that has ever been documented in Canada. <sighs> yes. So this is now a vulnerable population 
that has been endangered by Teal Jones' activity. While some are optimistic that these rare discoveries could stop logging, people here are up against a 200-year-old legacy of forestry in the province. Logging in British Columbia has gone on since the early 1800s and was once a slow process involving brave men cutting down giant trees one at a time. The arrival of combustion engines meant industrial vehicles could get to almost any logging site. And by the 1940s, trucks became the main source of transportation. Continual technological advances, including cable and even aerial logging, meant forests could be cleared faster than ever. While older operations crushed the undergrowth, wasting wood, newer methods used skylines to reduce damage. Eventually, by the mid-20th century, logging companies saw the value of replanting trees. Industry experts like to distinguish between managed tree farms just to grow wood versus replacing wild forest groves with monoculture seedlings. You have what you call an ecological downgrade, and you have actually an interruption in what we call the evolutionary process because forests that are not ecologically managed forests that don't have intact ecosystems also don't evolve the same way that forests that are conserved and preserved for their ecosystem integrity do. Whether it's a clear-cut conifer rainforest in the Pacific Northwest or a deforested tropical jungle in Southeast Asia, making way for palm oil plantations, the result is the same displacing or destroying local wildlife and compromising the delicate ecosystem. The science of forestry as it developed strikes me as having been less a science than an ideology that was with, with language that was as if conceived to deceive. Multiple use forestry begins with a clear cut. The annual allowable cut is never seen as a limit never to be exceeded, but a quota to be met old growth forests are seen to be decadent and over mature when by any ecological definition in terms of biodiversity they're, they're at the richest state. How is it every child can understand that in an old growth forest it's moist, it's cool, there's all sorts of moisture retained even in these old growth trees. You can put your, dig your hand down in there if it's hollow, there's probably going to be moisture in there. So we are losing the weather regulator. Close to Ferry Creek in the Cowichan Valley, another fight is underway. Filmmaker Isil Dobble is protecting forest groves that were to be left untouched, but are now up for logging. Isil studied journalism at Boston University and has a unique understanding of the forests that surround her. Here's an example you know, of an ecosystem. You've got all these different varieties. You've got um, cedar, you've got yew, fir. These nurse trees are part of that complexity of growing, so they actually hold, rain, they hold water. This is a, a nursing stump. It's completely different from a living stump. This is dead, breaking down, and it allows all these plants to grow. The moss on this, the moss in a forest actually gives off more oxygen than the trees. So when we cut down the forest, when we clear cut, we are doing extraordinary damage to our, you know, our lungs. It's, it, that's where the oxygen, a lot of the oxygen is coming from, including up the trees, the, the mosses on the trees you'll see as well. So this tree is about 150 feet tall, and if you look at its bark compared to you know, your hand, it's probably eight inches deep. So that's this heavy protection from fire during these times of, of drought. It's, it's protecting the forest in a way that these small tree plantation, 30 to 40 years, there's just no comparison. They, they are ignition. So this is, as opposed to the, the stump we just saw, which is a, it's dead technically, it's uh, it's full of life living on it. This has got no life on the outside, but it's actually alive. This is called a living stump. These are my favorites. They, um, they are all part of the 
infrastructure, the family of trees that are connected underneath the soil. So this is actually working to, it's a stabilizer, it's an anchor between all these trees around it. It's, they are sharing nutrients, water, carbon, and also um, warning signals. If there's pests that are attacking the trees, what if we could you know, take the time that's necessary to understand these connections that are holding the forest in place, keeping them alive? Herb Hammond is a professional forester with 30 years experience advising corporations, indigenous groups, and governments around the world. Tree farms are no more forests than wheat fields are grasslands. They lack the biological diversity, they lack the composition and structure to protect water, to provide for the sequestering or gathering of and storage of carbon. Our old forests are the sponge for heavy rains and they release the moisture when it's needed. And of course, everything in an old growth forest is a self-sustaining ecosystem. None of these whatever second growth forests can possibly do that. And the logging continues. There's been daily resistance um, from people of all walks of life so the sleeping dragon is basically when someone digs a hole into the, into the road and cements this dragon device into the ground, someone locks themselves into it. And uh, there's even something called a flying dragon, which was a stump suspended up in the air that someone's locking themselves to. It's pretty, pretty encouraging and amazing to see what people have been able to come up with just way out in the bush. They have been unsuccessful at removing everyone because people keep showing up and reinforcements keep coming. What's so amazing about Fairy Creek is that so many people have been attracted and have come at the expense of their jobs, the family or whatever. They realize that this is the last stand for these trees, that the moment that we leave the trees, the trees will be gone. And that's quite true, literally, because Teal Jones will be in there the next day uh, clear-cutting those trees. I just couldn't help but come here and protect this forest. Yeah, it's just inspiring to see all these beautiful humans that are willing to risk their lives and lay in front of these huge, heavy machinery. And in the years since I worked as a forestry engineer and studied forestry at the UBC in the late 1970s, one would have thought that things might have changed, but we still have our children feeling morally obliged to put their bodies between the forest and the machinery at places like Ferry Creek. And after all of this time, and with all that we know, this is something that should make my generation deeply ashamed. Looking from the outside, the protesters' actions seem futile. But activism of this kind can work. In the 80s and 90s, Protests in British Columbia over old growth logging in Clairquat Sound and Carmona Valley were equally tumultuous. Pressured by popular support, the provincial government had to buy back the tree cutting license from the logging company, turning the pristine forest into Carmona Walbrand Provincial Park, now preserved for all time. Frustrated by continuing police attacks, forest defenders like Raven speak directly to officers. This is the last 2.7% of our temperate rainforest. When you guys step foot on these grounds, how much does it break you inside? When you know all of this is keeping our oxygen going. You work for an establishment where you are supposed to serve and protect do you see yourself serving and protecting anybody else but money and a corporation? You guys wonder why it's getting so hot out there, that climate change? Why we're starting to get plus 45 degrees to plus 55 degrees? That is because it is the rain forest. Every single route that is connected from west to east, this helps us breathe. 
Though thousands of miles from Canada and the U.S., the Amazon rainforest serves as an important reminder of the impact vast jungle ecosystems can have on our lives. The Amazon rainforest is the world's largest and most biodiverse tropical rainforest. It is the most biodiverse terrestrial ecosystem. What does that really mean? That means it is the cradle of biodiversity. That massive forest actually generates its own rainfall. If those standing trees are there, it could generate rainfall that irrigates landscapes as far south as Argentina and as far north as the continental United States. Our rainfall in the United States, in the Sierras, the Rockies, our rainfall, our, our snowpack comes from the Amazon. It comes from the hydrological cycle created by those billions of trees in the Amazon, what scientists call the flying rivers. The Amazon rainforest is in a state of emergency at this time. The Amazon's on fire. Most people have seen the images of the Amazon rainforest set ablaze. Unfortunately, those fires are not wildfires. Those fires are intentionally set to make way for agribusiness, to make way for development. In addition to oil and mining exploration, deforestation in the Amazon is primarily driven by two agribusinesses, soy farming and cattle ranching. In the last 30 years in Brazil alone, cattle ranching driven by international meatpacking companies has destroyed more than 730,000 square kilometers of rainforest to supply the world's insatiable demand for beef. That represents an area bigger than Texas, the size of Chile, a rich jungle, home to indigenous peoples, plus thousands of animal species and plants, including potential medicinal ones that could cure disease. The loss of these carbon sequestering trees has now turned the Brazilian Amazon from carbon sink to carbon emitter. And soy farming, mostly for cattle feed, is wreaking more havoc. Scientists discovered that between 2000 and 2019, soybean cultivation more than doubled to an area the size of France. And scorching the earth is the preferred way to make room. And those fires are leading to the drought and deforestation and destruction of the Amazon rainforest. But that, those fires also directly relate to the drought and the destabilization of the hydrological system of the Amazon. And that directly impacts the West. So the fires in the Amazon and the fires in California are directly related. Not far from Ferry Creek protest site stands Big Lonely Doug. At 220 feet, at 66 meters, it's the second highest Douglas fir tree in Canada. Due to its size, it was left behind in a clear cut by a logger. For many, Doug remains as a powerful symbol. Does he know he's alone? What knowledge has he passed onto the seedlings beneath his trunk? Science is now just learning about the exchange of information via the fungal network. Perhaps in the future, new discoveries will reveal the true extent of tree communication. We're robbing ourselves of a most important climate disruption mitigator in losing these old growth forests. They have the highest level of biological diversity of any forest phase. I always find uh, peace and relaxation in the old growth forest, seeing these trees that are sometimes thousands of years old and, and, and the time it takes for them to grow, it really allows you to see the scale of time on a much different level than, than we're used to. 
Now more than ever, solutions must be found. Industry and governments need to come up with ways to balance the needs of people, the global economy, and the earth. Forestry has been sold uh, in British Columbia and as elsewhere in the world as something that's sustainable, when in fact uh, it's not sustainable. And as we have cut nature's legacy in, in British Columbia, and we're nearing the end of that, we essentially are writing the last chapter of a long-standing book that we might call Cut and Run. Finding solutions may start by simply thinking about forests in different ways. Not far from Ferry Creek is Wildwood, a model of selective, sustainable logging on a property founded by ex-logger Merv Wilkinson in the late 1930s. Merv actually grew up on this property. He played in this forest as a child. When he had the opportunity to buy it in 1938 and decided that uh, what he needed to do was steward it in a way that actually took care of the forest. Even then, the government began clear-cutting old-growth forests and replacing them with a monoculture crop of uniform, faster-growing trees. The entire rotation cycle, the foundation of sustained yield forestry, which has been the rationale for the industry from day one, was predicated on the assumption that every stick of old growth forest would be taken down. But Merv thought that was the wrong approach to take. He thought that was really critical here in managing BC forests was that you preserve the old growth integrity of those forests and you make sure that you did not eliminate all of that, uh, that old growth component. As late as the 1990s, Groups of forestry students would come to Wildwood to learn about sustainable logging practices that left much of the forest intact. Just driving up the coast this morning, uh, you look at all the, the landscape around you, and what I thought were trees and forests before don't even compare to what used to be here. Using a small portable sawmill, Merv was able to selectively log just the wood he needed to build his cabin, then sell leftover wood products to support the property, and the forest remained. So this is one of these really magnificent dug for old growth veterans that we have in our forest. This tree here is between, oh, four and 500 years old, and it's a real repertoire of knowledge. What we're looking at with this tree is in the upper canopy we have species that you find nowhere else in any other forest and it only exists in the upper canopy of an old growth dug fir. If you came down through here and if you took a slice out of the middle of this tree you would find and could determine the weather patterns for the past four or five hundred years. It's all encoded in the rings of this particular tree, but also encoded in the genetic material that it passes on to its seedlings in this forest. So these seedlings you see around here, which have naturally regenerated, have all the uh, stored knowledge that this tree has accumulated over time. And that allows them to be resistant, resilient, and adaptive to changes like climate change. So one of our best strategies for dealing with climate change is to keep these trees and these ecosystems alive and well. From selective low impact logging to high tech solutions using the ability of forests to sequester carbon, the answers are right in front of us. Projects around the world are benefiting groups such as Native American tribes who forego logging their land to be paid dollars for carbon offsets, leaving forests standing that absorb atmospheric CO2. This reduces global warming while helping their communities grow. But carbon credits are not without controversy. There's many ways to protect the Amazon indigenous rights or climate. Carbon credits, offsets, net zero commitments are not gonna get us there. They are false solutions to what really needs to happen. What we really need to happen is we need to stop cutting down forests. If a government or a company wants to contribute to 
protecting forests. They should do that without market mechanisms, without carbon credits. Because those carbon credits continue to allow polluters to pollute. That's what they're for. They are set up to continue business as usual. That's the sad truth. One new high-tech solution for the planet is coming from a young Silicon Valley company, Living Carbon, located in San Francisco. Founder, CEO, Maddie Hall, was just featured in Forbes magazine as one of the top young entrepreneurs in the country under 30. Along with her co-founder, futurist Patrick Mellor, they're shaking up the green tech world. The company is soon moving into flashy new headquarters backed by Silicon Valley investor dollars. They believe the way to stave off climate change is to genetically engineer trees that will hold more carbon, to recreate a primordial time on Earth when volcanoes made atmospheric CO2 amounts high and plants significantly reduced those dangerous levels. I'm Patrick Meller. I'm the co-founder of Living Carbon, along with Madeline Hall. And we are working to improve the carbon drawdown potential of terrestrial plants, starting with trees, and also the ability of plants to retain carbon that they remove from the atmosphere. We owe all of our advancement to the stored carbon that we've utilized as a species. And living carbon is important because we need to tell the story of how humans can actually give back to our planet and help our ecosystems become more resilient and use our technology thoughtfully in a way that isn't motivated around just profit, but motivated around carbon capture and making our world safer, not just for ourselves, but for all of our plant life. Some others seem to be doing well. Yeah. Oh, are these little winter buds? I know, those are just new leaves. They, they would have been winter buds. Most of the plants in this room are a nickel accumulating construct that we uh, aim to use on degraded land to uh, help reduce uh, metal concentrations in the soil and also which have decomposition resistance properties so they'll hold on to carbon longer. So all of these plants in the middle part of the room are the, uh, the mother trees that we are um, using to produce cuttings that we're testing all of their properties on. So this is one of our grow rooms. We have an acclimation room where the trees are acclimating from being in tissue culture, so a sterile environment, to being able to be grown in soil. There have been actually several periods in the history of the earth where there's been excessive CO2 in the atmosphere. And in all of those cases, the mechanism that removed the excessive CO2 was photosynthetic organisms, was plants that then did not decompose and did not return that CO2 to the atmosphere. And the most striking uh, example of this is the initial evolution of trees in the Carboniferous period. And when trees first evolved, fungi were not able to digest their wood. And so CO2 levels dropped from somewhere about twice what they are now to uh, below what they are now um, over quite a short time period and then remained low for over 30 million years. Living Carbon's plan is to provide these safe, non-pollinating, modified trees to vast tree farms that would grow faster than normal trees, leach chemicals from the soil, resist fungal decomposition, and thus retain carbon for many more years. Um, it is going to be necessary for humans to actively manage the composition of the atmosphere in partnership with other organisms on the planet. That we're not really going to be able to get out of this situation that we're in through emissions control alone or through anything that involves only a minimization of human impact. We have to actively engage with the rest of the biosphere to actively manage the composition of the atmosphere. There's this sense of urgency that we feel every day. In the same way that we have a launch window to send astronauts to Mars in a certain period of time, now is our time for deploying large-scale carbon removal technologies. Because we've gotten to where we are today because of our reliance on fossil fuels. 
and the energy that was stored within our planet. That energy is no longer going to be there, or it's not going to be as accessible in a post-global warming world. Where we put our money matters. So what, where are you banking? If your bank is specifically complicit in rainforest destruction, talk to your financial advisor about fossil-free funds. People don't realize how interconnected all of our world is. It is shocking to me how few people realize the connection between COVID-19 and climate change. COVID is climate change. Increased urbanization, loss of habitat for species, a lot of eroded and degraded land that's been used for agriculture or resource extraction that's no longer habitable. That's why you have a lot of these different animals and people living in such close proximity. Everyone can take action from your phone, from your desk, from your computer. For the Amazon, for indigenous peoples, for climate justice, for all of us, for the trees. The majority of populations around the world, societies around the world, do not base their relationship with the earth as on a kind of extractive paradigm, but rather on reciprocities. That the earth owes its bounty to people, people in turn owe their fidelity to the earth. And that has powerful consequences in terms of the ecological footprint of a people. So it seems to me that technology will always play a role in uh, finding solutions to some of these massive problems. But technology alone won't be enough. We have to change the way we think about the Earth. We are on a finite planet. We are biological beings living on a biological planet. And until we really embrace that, I don't think we'll be able to turn the corner and enter the kind of world we want to live in. Back in British Columbia, the battle to save the ancient rainforest of Fairy Creek has so far gone on for more than 15 months. Members of the Rainforest Flying Squad and other protesters have endured cold, wet, and put their lives on the line in the face of court-ordered police action and even retribution by local loggers. And uh, it's, it's very difficult for me to see these young people and the elderly too, you know. That's been the most difficult part is seeing how my, my forest family, my forest protector family has been treated um, by RCMP and some, some loggers who have been uh, aggressive and violent. That won't change our stance though. We will continue to remain peaceful and nonviolent. While some 1,100 arrests have occurred so far, reinforcements keep coming, hunkering down in key locations far up the logging roads in this vast mountainous region. The whole infrastructure, Canadian infrastructure, has been honed and designed to serve what we now call the colonial economy. But that is not my great objective at this time, is to save the old growth simply, to remind the world that yes, we do belong to our great mother. In a sense, the saddest thing in the whole scenario is that scientific forestry is actually possible. Sustain, sustained yield forestry is possible. We should in fact be implementing um, both notions on our finest growing sites that have already been disturbed. The fact that you hire a bunch of young kids to go tree planting doesn't mean that you've reconstituted a forest. You know, you have to, you have to manage a forest. And the truth is, if the practice of silviculture in British Columbia had been anything like its promise, we wouldn't have to be cutting into our irreplaceable remnants of old growth forest. 
I, th I think the, the fact that this is all still going on even to this day amidst all the climate change we're having and, and all the warnings that scientists have been giving for decades, I think it's just a sign of how removed our culture is from nature. Because if we, if, if we actively ignore it and, and things are just comfortable enough and we don't have to face what we are personally doing to contribute to this, then it's easier just to look the other way and it's easier to, to, to blame other countries or, or other wasteful practices. But in, in a way, if we are part of Western society, we contribute to it in some way and we have to face that reckoning. And that's a hard thing for people to do is to, to face the responsibility that we as individuals contribute to the planet's destruction. We have a chance for future generations to make a profound difference. And, and yet, if we do what we have done with the old growth, if we do not learn our lesson, we are going to do exactly the same thing. 40 years from now, we're going to wake up and look around, and it's going to be tree plantations all over British Columbia. And it's crime. It's absolutely criminal. And I don't mean the individuals, but as a collective, you know, it's up to all of us. It's something we can do. We can't save the world. We can't. You know, there's all sorts of problems beyond our boundaries, but this is something we can do in British Columbia, is to just wake up to what is happening all around us. If the tree falls in the forest, does anybody hear? Take out trees, take out wildlife at a rate of a species every single day. Take out people who've lived with this for a hundred thousand years. Inject a billion burgers worth of beef. Through thinning ozone, waves fall on wrinkled earth. Gravity, light, ancient refuse of stars speak of a drowning. But this, this is something other. If a tree falls in the forest, is anybody here? If a tree falls in the forest, is anybody here?